And it's Ken Kreitzer for Cam Vets Media. We cover cadets, midshipmen, the military, and veterans proudly since 2008. And it's uh, our favorite week of the year. It is Army Navy game week. The Black Knights will play the midshipmen three o'clock on Saturday in Philadelphia in front of a packed stadium and a national television audience on the big CBS. It's going to be uh, Quite a day now. Talk all about it. Uh, we have Colonel Sam Houston from the Beat Navy Studio in Huntsville, Alabama. Colonel, how are you? Reviving the Goat Busters. Army okay. Navy 84. <laughs> Army okay. won big. Won the Commander in Chief trophy that season. Yeah, it's okay. great to be here. It's wet, wet in Huntsville. There's a hurricane out in the Gulf about to hit Mobile. I probably was the only person in Alabama that did not know that until I went to the gym and had the Weather Channel on. So, uh, looking forward to beat Navy. Okay, and calling in from South Jersey from the class of 1992, we have former Army football player Steve Shalou. Big, <clears throat> big beat Navy week. Excited. That's, if this is Christmas, come early. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. And calling from West Palm Beach, Florida, from our team, our producer director, Richard Miller. How are you, Richard? Very well, Ken. It's Navy week. Beat, beat Navy. Absolutely. That's the message for the week. And now uh, from uh, Pelham, <laughs> uh, our Navy expert, uh, that is Jack McGurk. And Jack uh, did another fine job on our WVOX show today. Uh, giving an update on uh, what's happening in the military, in particular in the uh, Ukraine war. Jack, good to see you. Good to see you too, Kent. The biggest game of the year and for the Black Knights. And uh, they're looking to, uh, for a little payback after last year's Army-Navy game at the Meadowlands. Uh, that was a tough one, 17-13 loss for Army. Yeah, that was you know, a game that I would say Army was favored in and fairly confident going in that they would uh, – would be able to uh, do well, um, and uh, Navy had an, another idea, uh, especially that linebacker, Diego Fago, who I met at the uh, media day last year, had a tremendous game. The Army goes into this one, um, five and six, coming off of two straight wins uh, over UConn at home, and then a, a big win up in Amherst last week against uh, University of Massachusetts as uh, Army center and captain Connor Bishop said the best way to prepare for Navy was to uh, play well against Massachusetts. And they really did in all phases of the game. And kind of looking at, uh, you know, it's uh, two teams playing the option, going to rush the ball. Uh, Navy's averaging 244 yards a game rushing, giving up 85. And Army has got 304 yards a game rushing. And they're giving up 193. So there's an advantage to Navy on, on rushing defense. And uh, so uh, that's kind of, you know, one of the key areas of this. And uh, so let's go around the table. Uh, we're going to get to uh, talking about the conference uh, championship games that were played this past weekend, a few surprises. And then we'll talk a little bit about the schedule of, uh, of bowl games uh, coming up. Now, uh, Sam, this has uh, got to be your favorite uh, time of year to talk about the Army-Navy game. What are you thinking about this one? Well, we talked a little bit about it last week, but we can go into more detail tonight. Um, you know, the Army-Navy game, it, records are off the table. The, both teams are 0-0, um, and uh, this is the game takes on even more meaning this year because uh, neither team is uh, bowl eligible uh, or going to a bowl game. So this is their bowl game. And this is the greatest rivalry in college football, if not in sports. It's a spectacle that everyone should have on their bucket list, but it takes on additional meaning uh, for the long gray line. And, and of course, uh, folks who did not get into West Point and had to go to uh, the school in Annapolis and, and they graduated from there. So it takes on the meaning for them too. But, you know, all year long, we say beat Navy. This is when it's on the, this is when it's all on the table. You know, we're all in, 
it's beat Navy. My thoughts on the game. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. I believe that uh, Army has has kind of gotten their team turned back in the right direction. They've had a couple of very good, very strong wins in the past two games that they played. Uh, UConn obviously was the tougher of the two between them and UMass. But where the UMass game was concerned, you know, this was a game that Army was expected to roll, and they did. And so I do believe that in the past two games, we've seen the Army team we expected to see back at the beginning of the season. Um, I'd like to add to that that the Army defense has really stepped up their game pretty well, uh, dating back to the uh, ULM game. And, uh, you know, when you take a look at the, the body of work that they put together on the past four opponents, you know, even though Army's two and two over that time, Army's defense is really keeping the scoring way down for the opponents. And there's no reason to expect that the Army defense won't do the same thing against the Navy offense. Because of the two teams, Army statistically has a stronger offense. Um, both teams bring in a triple option, in theory, a triple option uh, attack. Both teams uh, live by the rush more than the pass. Navy probably passes more than Army does. Army's had more big plays than Navy has had this year on offense, and Army averages more uh, per game in the rushing department. But, again, this is Army-Navy, and the, the one bit of trepidation that I have going into the game I'm sure it's the question that all of uh, the uh, long range line who are going to be watching or in attendance, like like I'll be, like I know Steve will be, like you'll be there, Ken. <clears throat> the big the big moment of trepidation for me is, and the big question mark is, what offensive attack are we going to see against Navy? What are we going to be doing? Because the past two games against service academies have been absolute uh, just rotten eggs laid on the field, especially in the second half. Think about it. Army, Navy, a year ago, Army had a 13 to seven lead going into halftime. Should have even been bigger than that. Then in the second half, Army put a big goose egg on the scoreboard, zero points. And uh, their offensive attack ap production abs absolutely fell uh, through everything. It just didn't work. Nothing that they were doing, but they were so focused on trying not to lose the game that they lost the game. Then push it forward to the Air Force game uh, that we, you know, a lot of us were at. And you saw that big old stinky rotten egg that Army's offense laid on the field in the second half against Air Force, where Army led seven to three at halftime and then went ultra conservative again in the second half and uh, played not to lose, only to lose the game. And offensive production, I mean, 20 yards rushing in the second half against Air Force, absolutely pathetic. So what are we gonna see happen this Saturday? Um, I know Steve will probably talk about this a little bit more too. I'll just finish it by saying, like I said last week, what I want to see is I want to see Army to I want to see Army realize that that type of play not to lose philosophy on offense, especially in the second half, is not cutting it. And uh, you know what? Army's offense has been pretty much off the charts the past two games. Um, let's keep it going. Let's keep that play calling rolling. Let's keep getting the ball to the outside. Let's open up that playbook and. Uh, Let's play to steamroll Navy, not play not to lose just because we have a, a small lead at halftime. So looking forward to the game. I'll be there. Very happy. I just learned that my uh, hotel room got upgraded to a suite. Thank you, Marriott. And uh, that'll go well with uh, club level uh, seats. So uh, it'll be You're a nice, set. comfortable weekend. You're all set, Sam Houston. That's that's terrific. So your, your thought is on <laughs> offense, Army's got to open it up a little bit. Absolutely. One of the factors there is if Ajahn Marshall is able to play, he was uh, hurt, I believe, in the Connecticut game and didn't play against Massachusetts. Trey Murphy has done very well in his absence. But, 
As for Army's a little bit thin, is at the slot back position. Uh, Tyrell Robinson not expected to play. So uh, if Marshall could play, that's going to be a big help. And uh, if they can pitch that ball out to Brian Murphy, um, um, that can make a big difference. Uh, Steve, uh, what's your thought? How's the offensive line shaping up for this one? The offensive line is going to be <clears> – <throat> ready to go i mean it's just going to be a matter if they have the opportunity through the play calling to uh, to do what they need to be able to do i mean if you're going to stack the box and you're going to you know, stack the inside with eight or nine players it, it doesn't matter where where the offensive line is going to be um you know we're not going to have the success what we need to be able to do so we got we got to get that ball outside and there's no reason not to i mean we're not going to a bowl uh, nobody's jobs in jeopardy, really, really coaching wise. I mean, Coach Monk is not on the hot seat, so I, I think we ought to let it rip and and let's see what we can do if we play free and pre play, you know, exciting, uh, exciting to us. Maybe not to other schools what we run, but let's get that ball outside and make them make decisions and loosen up that that line of scrimmage a little bit. Give that offensive line some opportunity. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, it a, is, is it a factor that the quarterback situation is now defined? I hear Tyler is going to start, play most of the game unless he gets hurt. And uh, is, it e is it easier for the offense to operate if they know there's going to be who the quarterback is and, and that's going to stay for the, most likely the length of the game? Yeah, you know, I think um, – I think that you know, the Tyre, you know, is is probably their their guy, and and uh, I don't think it makes much of a difference for the offensive line per se. I mean, it makes a difference for continuity. I, I'm not a huge fan of, of alternating quarterbacks because you're not going to get into a rhythm. Um, so Tyre's got to be, you know, doing his thing, and if he's getting that ball outside and he's eliminating that pitch key. Uh, not pitching too early, if he's doing it to the situation and not to an internal clock, which I think he did in, in the UMass game. I think he was pitching early because his <laughs> internal clock told him to. If he's reading and doing and reacting and, and pitching and, and taking what the team gives him, uh, I think he'll do extremely well. He's been very decisive and he's run hard and he's been doing very awesome uh, in terms of what, what, what needs to be done. So, um I think the team loves his reckless abandon, the way that he plays. Uh, I think they're behind him 100. percent uh, They'll be behind whoever's there, but you know, I think I think Tyre is probably their guy. So Sam, do you uh, agree? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, he Tyre Tyler. He, I believe, he had his best game of the season against UMass, and I agree with Steve. There were a few times where uh, they were taking the ball to the outside, and it seemed like his head was timer rather than reading the defense on the pitch but uh from a quarterback standpoint I think in the past two games um what Tyler has been able to do is show that yeah he can effectively run the playbook and every play does not have to be a you know a, a B back up the middle tire Tyler left tire Tyler right you know situation so that being said, uh, you know, the real hope is, is that uh, when we go into this game, that the offensive game plan, um, you know, while making adjustments and those adjustments are going to be to look for ways to loosen up Navy's defense by rather than constantly attacking eight men in the box, you're uh, forcing them to spread their defense more and, uh, you know, make sure that they're in the right position for the type of reads that the triple option can make. And, uh, you know, we'll catch somebody out of position and, and go for a long gainer. And I believe that Tyler is, he's ready to do that. He's got to be trusted to do that. And I really hope that they do trust him to do that this weekend, because again, um, if the offensive game plan backs into a situation where we're doing the, ultra conservative play not to lose be back quarterback left quarterback right inside the tackle over and over again 
it's going to make for a long, long day in Philadelphia. Um, and that's just a fact. So play to play to tires maturity, let him run the offense, trust him with the offense. We're not going to a bowl, as Steve said. Nobody's job is on the line. Open up that playbook and and by golly, let's go gangbusters on offense, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it for four quarters, man. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, and if you're watching and you have a question, just write it in the comment section. We'll do uh, take your question. Or if you want to know where you're watching from, that's always fun to hear. Let's hear from Jack McGurk. He's, Jack, you've been following Navy all season. Um, uh, what does Navy look like to you? Uh, um, they're coming off a big win over, over Central Florida. Yeah, that was a big win. We're uh, nationally ranked number 17, UCF. Um, they look like a pretty strong, you know, triple option team. This defense is, it's a very strong that you pointed out the, that, um, opponents are averaging just 85 yards rushing per game, uh, which shows you how strong this Navy defense is, uh, in particular, John Marshall, the linebacker who, uh, actually set a record. It was a uh, 10 and a half sacks this season, which is a single season record for Navy. Um, in fact, in that UCF game, he had four sacks. So if the uh, Army uh, offense, their big priority is watch out for John Marshall. <laughs> uh, make, the offensive line has to make sure he doesn't break through. But, I talked um, to John Marshall at the media day, by the way, Jack. Um, mm -hmm. uh, sharp guy. He is going to branch uh, cyber in the Navy. Oh, how about that? Um, but... Uh, as I said, Navy is another, you know, triple option offense. Uh, they seem to do much stronger games where they avoid that. There was a game recently where they had zero yards passing and it turned out really well for them. Um, actually, it might've been the UCF game. Um, and uh, actually, I'm sorry, there was, Xavier Island had an incomplete pass. So it wasn't that game, it was the previous one. Um, I guess Notre but, Dame was the previous game. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Um, well, actually, Notre Dame uh, won that game. But uh, Navy seems to do pretty well when they, uh, you know, avoid passing. It's just like Army. Same thing. We had that weekend where Army, Air Force, and Navy uh, all had zero yards passing. Pretty remarkable. But, um, yeah, Navy, this is the team, you know, uh, they struggled earlier in the year, and they seem to have improved since then. But, you know, with the Army-Navy game, there's always the intangibles, which is, that uh, both teams, when they get to this game, everybody steps up because it's the biggest game of the year. <laughs> no doubt. Now, do we have a feel for who's going to play quarterback for Navy between Ty Lavatai and Xavier Arline? Uh, I think it's probably going to be Ty Lavatai. Uh, is he back? I thought he was out for the season. Unless he's still out, yeah. i got to look at these reports here. Because our line started the past couple of games by my record. Oh, yeah, you're right. It goes Xavier our line, yeah. So that, that makes a difference. Uh, Ty Levitai was having a very good year for Navy, 93 yards a game. Um, and uh, throwing the ball well. But uh, I'm sure Xavier Arline, we've seen him before. Uh, will be a strong competitor. It was interesting uh, talking to John Marshall. Um, he had um, 41 solo tackles on the season, 47 of 87 total tackles. And like you said, Jack, uh, 10 and a half sacks and 18 and a half tackles for lots of plays. They describe it as a striker uh, position which is kind of a hybrid linebacker. Is that a correct description, Steve? Yeah, he's kind of a hybrid safety linebacker. Uh, he's, I mean, he's, he's a buck 99 uh, weight-wise. I mean, he's not that big. Um, so it's more of a, might be a nickel, like a nickel uh, safety type, type person. And uh, Brian Lane is also a free safety back. Seven tackles and Nicholas Straw. They call it a winner position. I guess that's uh, uh, that the other safety is that the safety position. 
a little hard to, to understand you, Ken. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sad, sorry. It's um, is that the Raider? They call that position the Raider um, at Navy. That Nicholas Straw is flying the senior, 46 tackles on the season. Yeah, that's sort of an outside linebacker type defensive yeah. end person. Okay. He goes two. I mean, he's about 230, 235. Okay. Very good. And I met Dion Nichols, a kicker who uh, won three games as kicking for Navy. And as a physics major, he's going nuclear submarines. And then uh, somebody dear to your heart, uh, Steve, Kip Franklin, the offensive tackle, uh, 6'1", 306. And, yeah, he, was a, he was a big kid when I saw him, pretty big kid. Yeah, he was right he's tackle. Awesome. They're going to need a big boat for him. <laughs> it's funny uh, when I I did the um, I, I had the opportunity to cover New York City Fleet Week and got a chance to go out to um, uh, the amphibious assault ship that was part of um, Fleet Week and I met him. I actually was I met him in the uh, in the officers' mess. Big guy he stood down from the sailors on mm -hmm. the ship, and uh, when we talked, he wants to uh, go into aviation. He said he's got to slim down a little bit after the season. I knew that well. I went aviation. I went from 327 down to 240. You can do How hard is that to do? Mm -hmm. A lot of salads, a lot of running. A lot of salads, a lot of running. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Jack, so any other thoughts about uh, you see in Navy? Um, they, uh, they're passing uh, 53 completions out of 122, six interceptions. And on pass defense, 218 out of 336 completions against them. They got they have picked off eight balls. Mm. Um, so um, you know these teams know each other really well. Coaches know each other really well. Um, you know Navy has come up with a few wrinkles in these games, and uh, we will see what happens now. Let's give uh, Richard Miller a chance. And Richard, why don't you take us through the conference championship games played this past weekend that sets okay. up the whole schedule? Okay. The uh, as far as the uh, conference champion championship games go, this, this past over the weekend, number eleven Utah is the Pac-12 champion, defeating number four USC forty-seven to twenty-four. Number two Michigan forty-three to twenty-two. Over Purdue, Michigan finishes the year at 13 and 0. The defending national champion Georgia Bulldogs, a 50 to 30 win over LSU. Number 14, Georgia is 13 and 0. Kansas State needed overtime to defeat the uh, TCU Horn Frogs and the Dr Pepper Big 12 Championship, 31 to 28. TCU is 12 and 1. Kansas State is, is 10 and 3. ACC Championship, 39 to 10. Number 9, Clemson, 11 and 2, defeats number 23, North Carolina. 39 to 10. 9 and 4 is North Carolina on the season. Number 18, Tulane, 45 to 28 over UCF. UCF finishes at 9 and 4. Tulane is 11 and 2. In the American Athletic Conference Championship. And as far as and as far as right now, the college football play, playoff rankings. In, in case you're wondering, the Georgia Bulldogs are number one. They will be facing off Ohio State in one semifinal. Michigan will be facing off against TCU in the, in the other semifinal. And as far as the the uh, the bowl week goes, let's see. Let's, let's, let's take a Rich. Why don't we go through these a little bit and get our panels. Uh, Thoughts? Anyone surprised at how badly you, Southern California played against Utah on Friday night? I, I was surprised how poorly a team could tackle. A USC just didn't want to wrap their arms around anybody, and and Utah wanted to take it to them. Yeah, that that was a uh, <clears throat> that was interesting to see. That that was a, a story of talent versus might or, or 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 intensity because they just didn't want to tackle yeah and neither one was, of them got into the college football playoff off of, off of that no. i mean usc was 
all USC had to do was win and they were in. So I, I was surprised, but I was not disappointed. So it's a funny story. I, I was at a local watering hole Friday night, uh, maybe singing a little karaoke and the game was on there. And the vested interest that everyone in the bar had about that particular game and the TCU game the next day is that keep in mind, this is Alabama. And so all of these, uh, you know, roll tide or bust folks around here, uh, they were watching closely the, uh, the top four to see how they did in their conference championship games. And, uh, you know, when USC got absolutely rolled by Utah and then TCU lost, uh, you know, you had people around here really getting their hopes up that Alabama was going to get backdoored into the BCS because they're Alabama, of course. But I think the BCS got it right. I don't think Alabama does, you know, I hope no one in my neighbors hear me say this, but <laughs> I don't think Alabama deserved to be in the BCS this year. I'm glad they're not. And I'm glad that they kept TCU in it. So every team in the BCS is either undefeated or they only have one loss. They're the top four teams. They deserve to be in it. So I think they got it right. <clears throat> Interesting. You got two big 10 teams uh, for the first time in a while. And uh, are you surprised that Georgia uh, rolled over LSU the way they did? No, not even a little. Not even a little. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michigan I over Purdue, and a good ball game for TCU and Kansas State. I, yeah, TCU. TCU could only only ride that magical horse, you know, for twelve wins. It it they just made too many mistakes and relied upon their ability to come back mm -hmm. until that that until that bar that Bronco bucked them too much, right? So. Yeah. yeah, but I, you know, they are not. If they went head to head against Alabama, Alabama, Alabama would beat them by two touchdowns. Okay, probably so. Probably so. Um, as as would Clemson. You know, TCU. Uh, one thing about them in that game, uh, their their conference championship game, you know their quarterback really made a heroic performance in the second half to get them back into the game and get them into overtime. And uh, it came down to, uh, you know, third and one uh, inside the five yard line and then fourth and one inside the, the five yard line. And what about some really head scratching play calling going on at that point when you got that big bruising quarterback you just wonder. I, I know that you can sit there and play armchair quarterback all day long, but I don't. I just don't know what TCU was thinking on third and one, and then fourth and one inside the five yard line in overtime that, with the play calling that they made. They just literally set Kansas State's defense up for a goal line stand. Um, but you know, they still got in the BCS. See how they do. They have had a magical season, but I think the wheels. But you know, I agree with Steve. I think the wheels are about to come off. Okay. Well, so we have the bowl games that were announced. Uh, Richard, do you want to take us through uh, some of the bowl games that start uh, on December 16th with uh, Miami playing Miami of Ohio? Miami of Ohio playing UAB, yeah. That will, that will, be, de that will be December 16th as uh, let's see. Um, it's in okay, the Bahamas. Uh, my iPad is back up. The Bahamas Bowl, December 16th, UAB against Miami of Ohio, 1130. The Cure Bowl, number 24, Troy, and number 25, UTSA. That's two teams close to each other in terms of ranking wise. The Cure also, Bowl is at three o'clock. Also, two teams have beat Army by narrow margins. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see who comes out on top. UTSA won the Conference USA championship game over North Texas. And sadly, the North Texas coach was fired. The fellow we who played against, Ar who coached against Army back in the 2016 bowl game down in Texas at Army won. And then Saturday, we got it's a good game, Cincinnati-Louisville up at Fenway Park in Boston. 
Uh, see if they can squeeze that field in a little bit better than they did the last time. I think they had to put the goalposts up on the, on the wall of the stadium. It's so tight to put the football field into Fenway Park. I saw it. I saw an uh, overhead view of what they did. I think they took the wall down in right field. Oh, okay. Well, I, well, I got the bullpens out there, I guess, and uh, and it's very narrow in that corner. Yeah. Um. So then you got Florida, Oregon State, Richard. Um, the Las Vegas Bowl. That's a two thirty game. The LA boy, LA Bowl, Fresno State taking on Washington State, three thirty. The Lending Tree Bowl at five at five forty five. Southern Miss and how did, Rice. How did Rice get in with a five and seven record? By the way, uh, they didn't. They didn't have enough uh, teams with a six win, and so they took some five five win teams, and they go off of a. Uh, there's a there's a ranking for <clears throat> graduation rates and other things that they go off of, and we would not have made it, even though. I scratched my head on that, but we would not have been a part of that. Because yeah. two of Army's five wins were against uh, uh, the football uh, championship subdivision. Even if we had five wins, uh, our ranking for academic and others are not as high as Rice was. And you, know, you mentioned North Texas. You can keep in mind uh, back in 2016 when Army played North Texas in a very thrilling Heart of Dallas Bowl. North Texas came into that game, uh, I think five and five and six or five and seven or something like that. So they had a losing record coming into the game. <clears throat> well, they're gonna play Boise State in the bowl in Texas, uh, just north of Dallas. And uh... And the other one, SMU has got a pretty tough bowl game in New Mexico. SMU against BYU would be kind of an interesting one. SMU is really middle school at elevated program. Um, and uh, UConn's going to go down to where we, where Ari played the, the opener, Myrtle Beach Bowl. UConn will play Marshall. Yeah, let's see, what do you got for Tuesday, December 20th, uh, Richard? The, <clears throat> Tuesday, December 20th is the famous Idaho Potato Chip Bowl, Eastern Michigan and San Jose State. That, that's a 3.30 game. The Yaboka Raton Bowl at 7.30 that night will be Toledo against Liberty. Liberty the North and the Western Army of Hawaii. And then another one, Western Kentucky against South Alabama. On the 21st. And then on the 22nd, uh, Richard, you got Baylor playing Air Force in the Armed Forces Bowl. Yep. In Fort Worth at TCU Stadium. Game Army has sort of dominated in recent years, 23 yes. times. Uh, yeah. How do we feel about Air Force playing Baylor? Oh, boy. Uh, I'd feel pretty good. I, you know, I'd feel pretty good about Air with for Air Force in that game. Um, Baylor, Baylor hasn't had, you know, uh, the greatest of seasons. So they're definitely beatable. Um, the only thing that you might expect from Baylor is that they might bring more fans to the game since they're so close to Waco there. But uh, Air Force, you know, they're when Air Force is on, Air Force has got a really good team this year. You know, when you've got that many fifth-year starters, <laughs> you you kind of gel on both sides of the ball. So uh, I, I personally, I think that Air Force will win that game. Okay. And uh, Louisiana will play Houston on December twenty-third, and also Lake Forest will play. Surprise! Forest didn't uh, elevate itself further this year. Uh, then get into the ACC championship game. Is that a bit of a disappointment for them? Who's that? Oh, uh, Wake Forest. I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah, you're cutting out a little bit, Ken. Wake Forest. Uh, all I can figure about Wake Forest this year is that they were 
red hot. And then my theory is somebody figured out how to properly defend that super delayed run pass option thing that they run. And, uh, and I, I think it started with Louisville who just absolutely destroyed Wake Forest. And then their season just kind of, kind of tanked from there. You know, they looked like they were en route to a 10 win season, maybe more. They looked like they were a shoe in to, to probably be in the ACC championship and they didn't even get a sniff. They still got into a bowl game. So Sam Hartman gets another chance. And this, the bowl game, I think, for Wake Forest is really their chance to kind of redeem their, what they had expected for their season by at least getting a bowl win. Okay. Well, maybe let's head back to uh, our game for this week. We'll catch the balance of the bowl games uh, maybe next week. But uh, let's get back and uh, go through uh, some more of, of what is the uh, really iconic college football game that we all enjoy so much, uh, Army versus Navy. And uh, Sam, is there a favorite moment of Army-Navy week or the Army-Navy game for you? Well, you know, <clears throat> I want to say, you know, that there is, there's obviously the pageantry and everything, but I, I got to say, you know, in the last few years when I've been at the Army-Navy game, uh, I've always been at the tailgate when the March on happens and everything like that, because it's unfortunate the March on happens so soon before the game, because a lot of people never see it because they're still out tailgating. But of course, the March ons are always, a, a, they're really quite a great spectacle to observe. And if, if you've you've never been to, or even if you have been to an army Navy game and you have not actually taken the time to go see the March ons, you should find your way into the stadium early and actually see why we always say you'll figure it out pretty quick that, uh, you know, army marches way better than Navy does. Um, <laughs> much more different. they look much sharper on the field. Um, probably, uh, my, funniest moment uh, to remember about an army navy march on was um my yearling year uh which was the same year as goat busters mm -hmm. um i had uh me and me and some of my uh, company classmates we had stayed with a, another company classmate who lived there in south philly and on the morning of the game i realized i had forgotten my low quarters and uh we couldn't find any that would fit well it turned out that one of my uh, company classmates had a broken arm, so he wasn't going to participate in the march on. But he had some uh, kind of like dress, like uh, going out shoes that were black that could kind of pass as low quarters. So he let me borrow his to so that I would have low quarters to wear for the march on. The problem is I'm a size nine and a half foot. He was size seven and a half foot. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I squeezed my nine and a half into a seven and a half and did the march on. And let me tell you something, uh, that was uh, the most painful attempt to look like I was marching in step and, and looking quite disciplined ever because my feet were, they were a total mess by the end of the game when I finally pulled those shoes off of my feet. Mm. Um, but there's so many great moments of an Army Navy game. Um, you know, every year Army wins, it's special. So uh, we're looking forward to more great memories this weekend, watching Army beat Navy. Okay, absolutely. Uh, uh, Jack McGurk, you were out on the field last last year before the game for much of the mm -hmm. festivities. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite moment? Oh, there was a lot of great moments. The, the whole pomp and parade of the event is pretty remarkable. Uh, starting off with the march on by the cadets and the midshipmen marching on uh, to the field is pretty impressive. Um, the uh, of course there's a flyover. You have the uh, Navy jets, the Blue Angels, I think, and the Army helicopters flying over. And as you pointed out, the Army helicopters they can fly a little bit slower and at lower altitude over the stadium, so they make a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, and uh, I believe, I don't think they had it last year because the weather, um, when they have the, uh, the parachuters go into the stadium, I'm not sure if they're doing that this year. Um, but uh, that's always impressive when they do it up at West Point, at least. 
Uh, and I think in 2020, we couldn't see the planes at all flying overhead. Yeah, that was 20. I think that was the up at West Point when they had the Army Navy game there, which was uh, very memorable. That was when uh, Army shut out Navy 15 um, you know, on, uh at Mikey Stadium and also on my birthday. So that was a pretty fun game to watch uh, from home. Uh, very memorable. There had a great, uh, there was a great goal line stand by Army in that game as yeah. well. So the players all, all point that out. Um, and it was the day that they bust up 4,000 midshipmen to West Point, the only time it's ever happened in history. And, and one of the, it was a memorable day, and, and Army came out with a win after that one. And one of the it, fun things about the, uh, the rivalry is um, there are stories going way back, if you look at the history of these two schools, of the mascots getting kidnapped or pranks being pulled. Like there's stories of um, people, for, uh, you know, cadets from West Point going down to the Naval Academy and kidnapping Billy the Goat or guys from Navy coming up to West Point. Actually, there was a, one in 1992, I read, that uh, some uh, midshipmen from Navy went up to West Point and they actually cut telephone wires and uh, tied up some people at West Point with zip ties before you know, they're kidnapping the mules up at West Point. And at that point, the Academy thought, you know what, enough's enough. We shouldn't be doing this anymore. So <laughs> since then, I think it's been a little bit more tame, but um, I don't know, maybe Sam and Steve have more stories one year, like that. One year, Jack, we got the lowdown on that from the, from the Navy first captain, mm. who was actually from our native Pelham. Okay. And she told us the story of uh, sending some people, some midshipmen up to West Point and and capturing the mule and driving all over New York State to try to evade authorities that were looking for them. Um, if you see the superintendent spirit video, uh, he he finds an alternative. They said, we're not going after goats anymore. So he came up with a new alternative to uh, to uh, hijack from the, uh, from the Naval Academy. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen that. It's kind of a lengthy video. They put a lot of time into it. Steve, is there a favorite moment uh, for you of the Army Navy game? Well, I I will go on record saying that I've never seen a march on in person, so that was good. Uh, I, I, uh, and at my <clears throat> world-renowned tailgates, we do have the march on on TV, so we play that on the CBS Sports um, Network because they play the march on. Sure. Um, so everybody who has kids at the academy can stay at the tailgate and drink and say that they watch the march on. It's called yeah. quibbling. It's a little, little, little things that we can do uh, that they can tell their cadet children that uh, they watch the march up. Um, you know, just you know, I got, I got the, the, the blessing of being able to play in four uh, Army Navy games in the uh, three in veterans and then uh, one up in the Meadowlands. So, you know, it was uh, just the spectacle, the, the, the crowd. Um, my junior year, we we beat uh, we beat Navy pretty handily, um, blocking for for Mike Mayweather and Cal Cass, and it was one of my most favorite times ever playing football, just being able to impart our will on that team. So, um, and one of the memories that I like about you know I like and I dislike right now is that Friday night. Before the game, uh, we, we generally go out as a group and uh, then we'll go to a, a, a watering hole in Philadelphia and we meet there and some former Navy players and former Army players uh, get together and uh, at, right around midnight, we do a toast to Alton Grizzard, who was uh, the quarterback who played during, uh, during when we played, who was, who, whose life was taken. Uh, he was a Navy SEAL and uh, it was taken um from, from somebody in, uh, he was murdered. Um, and so we, we pray, you know, uh, uh, a little tribute to, to him and, and the brothers that, that passed before us. So that's a pretty touching thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Richard, uh, watching the game, you have a favorite uh, moment you're looking forward to seeing again? Justin. Just in fact, the you know the, the pageant, the pageantry, the, the flyover, the, the the national anthem, just 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 the entire pop and pop and circumstances. I'm big on like the the pregame like ceremonies, like just in fact the the the, the atmosphere. Absolutely, oh, it's, uh, yes. 
I always like, I have to say, uh, we've had the opportunity to watch the uh, March Ons live, I think each of about the last 10 years, and there's nothing like it. Um, uh, last, uh, Jack was with me last year when we were on the field and right in front of the first captain um, for Army as uh, she led the, the uh, corps out there. Um, and and it's, it's neat, they practice it and the first captain never looks back to see that everybody's following the way they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they've had, they, they practice it. How many times do you think they practice doing the march on before it happens in Philadelphia? Oh, well, I mean, they do it. I mean, I'm just thinking back to when I was a cadet. Uh, we would practice the march on. There'd be uh, two or three days in a row, um, the week leading up to the game, where we would be practicing the march on and we would roll, we would go through the entire practice uh, probably about three or four times. Um, and then we would just uh, focus on doing the, you know, the, the silent signal drills, you know, with the hat and doing the rocket cheer and, and the salute and everything else that they do. So they do practice it a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of inconvenient um, because the weather, it, you know, they don't even respect the weather. You got to get ready for the march on because there's no way in the world they're going to let Navy look better than Army in, in the march on. And so that's why Army, I, may, I know now how much do they practice it? Maybe probably none. They, they just line up and go out there. They just gaggle out there because that's all they do anyway is just gaggle around. Well, if you, if you see uh, the Dean Spirit video, uh, Dean uh, Brigadier General Sean Reeves, uh, he has a choice. He has a choice comment because he um, does a dialogue with one of Army's um, astronauts, um, and yes. uh, they ask about if if um, the Navy's uh, march on looks any better from space. Yeah, than yeah, it does it in funny. person. Yeah, so I recommend that video. Very clever. That is funny dialogue in in uh, in, the, in General Reeves' the spirit video. Um, <clears throat> You know, one piece of news that came out at the media day, sort of under the radar, is that uh, they are pretty confident about starting the rebuild of the stadium uh, right after graduation next year in June. Um, that they expect it. Uh, we're, I talked a little bit with athletic director Mike Buddy, and he said that the uh, it's a 20 month project, and it would start. Uh, after graduation next uh, next May, and uh, and the stadium will look different for uh, for going forward. Um, they're going to take down the east stands that we've seen, and then they're going to build a big structure that's going to house the Corps of Cadets in front, and then um, there will be luxury box seating and and uh, and also a lot of space in that facility. Uh, my understanding is that road's going to close down. Uh, between the stadium and Lust Reservoir, which is going to create, I'm curious how they're going to handle logistics because there's not a lot of ways to go north south in, at West Point's uh, campus. I, I don't think the road's going to close. I think it's going to be removed. <clears throat> yeah, because I mean that's the design I've seen is that there's no uh, they're 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 going to they're going to build a structure over that whole, entire space all the way out to uh, the reservoir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna mean more traffic on uh, Thayer Road leading right through the main academic area and then uh, around the east, <laughs> the west side of the stadium, I guess. But uh, uh, it's gonna look different. You know, one of the things we talked to Mike Buddy about were some pictures that um, uh, our friends at the Brigade Review came out with that showed Mikey Stadium in the 1920s. And they were showing a baseball game being played. Uh, right in the stadium, right with home plate uh, down in the south uh, southwest corner, and pretty big crowd there. But and then we saw another picture, you know, where that whole area where the east stands was was a grass field. It was right field of the baseball field, and I was surprised. I still haven't heard how long they played baseball there, but it did seem to answer the question about why General MacArthur didn't build a full bowl or a full U-shaped stadium when they when they might have. And do you guys have any more background on, on the history of Mikey Stadium? No, I don't have any more than that. 
How do you yeah. feel about this project? Do you feel like it's um, uh, it's going to be um, something for all for the fans to look forward to? My my only, I mean, my my real thought about it is, I mean, okay, I I, I like the concept, um, but I think that uh, West Point really needs to be able to address the uh, real concerns that people have had that, that has kept a lot of people away from the games. And that is the whole process of getting onto the Academy and, uh, you know, getting park and getting into the stadium and, and still being able to enjoy the uh, West Point experience for on game day. Um, so if, if you can't get the fans into the stadium, you're not going to have the fans to enjoy the upgrades to the stadium. So they, they really need to address that. And another thing that I think that, uh, you know, this is just my personal opinion and it's been brought up this season before. I really think that army needs to, they need to, to sit back down with CBS sports network who care, who car carries most of the games we know. And when army plays at home, it's, it's usually CBS sports network, but, uh, if they can get the squids to come to the table and uh, look at a way of maybe flip-flop and start times of the games, um, you know, every other Saturday, because every Saturday army, it, when they have a home game, army's at noon, Navy's at three. So, and then Navy, you know, our, uh, uh, the, uh, the Marine Corps Memorial stadium that they play in is not even on the uh, Naval Academy grounds. It's in Annapolis. So, those security concerns are not even there for their stadium, but they get a three o'clock kickoff time. So people can get parked, they can tailgate, they can do all they want. But at, at Army, my gosh, man, you know, cut some slack, see if we can figure out a way to uh, start getting fans back into the stadium by, by making it less of a haze and a hassle just to get on to West Point on game day and, and actually be able to enjoy the game day experience. All right, I got to ask this question. How many home games you go to this year, Sam? Zero. Okay, so you do not have the latest information. <laughs> All right, I don't now, have. <laughs> I happen. I happen to be friends with the Garrison Commander. All right, they did an outstanding job this year, getting people into, onto West Point and into their parking spots. Better than it's been in years. And I think they've solved that problem. I don't want to call you out on it, but I'm calling you out on it. This well, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out, Steve. Uh oh. You, you need to help get the word out because I'm telling you, the perception though is still there that uh, the service that that West, that West Point is still a hassle to get on. And I I I just know from reading deep into the forums and the comments that people make that, uh, you know, they've literally stopped going to home games because of how much of a hassle it's always been to get onto the, to the, so maybe, uh, you know, maybe when you have the ear of the garrison commander, it might be a good idea to get the PAO involved in getting some real messages out to army fans, especially, you know, ones that live in the area, ones that, uh, you know, maybe are, uh, season ticket holders or used to be season ticket holders or maybe they just came to one or two games a year and they always enjoyed it but they've kind of stopped going because of you know the experiences in the past few years help get that word out so that people know hey uh, you know it's not the same we, you know come on out and you'll see that it's not the hassle that it was and you can come back out and enjoy uh you know army football and i know that the last home game i was at of course i was there with you and um so you know, we were right there. Which game were you at last year, Sam? What's that? Which game were you at last year? The Bucknell Wait. game. The, the, the game where the uh, torrential hailstorm hit at, at, at halftime that, that uh, evacuated Mikey Stadium, except for the superintendent's loge. So we got to keep partying up there. Oh, and watch okay. There you go. Zoom. But uh, you yeah. know, Steve and I, we were out. We were out at a lot at like six thirty in the morning. So you know, it, there was nobody out there then except us um, at the tailgate. Well, my my suggestion for next year is they consider moving one game to Yankee Stadium. 
mm. as they did a few years ago with the stadium, with a quarter of the stadium under construction. Uh, might be a time to play some other games there. Um, and also for the sake of getting some visibility in the New York City media market, trying to get the radio and TV stations to uh, look at West Point football as something they need to talk about a little bit more. Steve, you're shaking your head. I know you just don't like it because you lose your sail your tailgate spot. <laughs> you have to do it in the Bronx. It is a terrible venue. Now, I mean, I was born and raised a Red Sox fan. Don't get me wrong. Oh, but but it is a terrible, <laughs> terrible venue to watch football. Uh, terrible. The best place, the best place to sit in the house is that it was the Delta Sky. The, the Delta tariff that's behind home plate because mm -hmm. you can be in the end zone, but if you're sitting on the first or third base side, you're you're it's it's you're 30 degrees tilted to the field. It's really yeah. difficult. It's really difficult to watch. It's still it, Yankee it, Stadium, though, Steve. I know, and it disgusts me. I get it, but it's just it's not a good venue for that. And and I know <laughs> inside, inside. Uh, Inside baseball, um, they don't want to give up any home home dates, and we're going to move the core to the end zone. They're going to do the work, start doing the work, and they're decreasing the they're decreasing the capacity of the stadium. So that that should take care of some of the some of the uh, uh, you know big game capacity getting on post type issues, but it it I. I, I I don't think I'd go back to Yankee Stadium and watch a game. <laughs> I found I, I enjoy. I go up the upper deck and right field, and it's a great view of the field. Like I usually go there to watch the uh, pinstripe ball. Uh, what if they so, played okay. at uh, City Field in Queens? Which one? At City Field in Queens. Oh, I'm there. Mm. <laughs> now I, I I would see. I, I would have to see how the field was laid out. I mean, even. Even playing down in Arlington for the game, that was a tough venue because it's a baseball stadium. It's tough, mm -hmm. it's tough to watch football. I, you know, our our seats were in the end zone. I kept the same seats that I got last year, this year, and we're in the end zone. I'm an offensive lineman by by love and by trade, and watching football from the end zone is the way we always watch film. Right? It was always down the pipe. We're looking from the end zone view, and I love yeah. that. View. Most people don't watch it that way, but I love it. So, but, you know, depending upon what sideline you are, you're, you could be 65, 70 yards away from the action just because of how far you are away. Mm -hmm. And I just, just not made for a baseball stadium. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, the, the, at Arlington Stadium, the uh, seats in right field were uh, distant from the field. And uh, so, okay, well, let's, uh, let's finish up. We, um, at the Army Navy game on Saturday, and uh, let's just for a second talk about defense, because that could be where this game is won. Uh, Leah Lowen and Markel Broughton have really led the charge on defense for Army uh, in terms of tackles, and uh, you've had some players um, like uh, Jimmy Charlo uh, have very good seasons, and uh, Quinn Hammonds. And uh, Max Domenico have had very good seasons on defense. What does the defense have to do to stop Navy's running game this year and uh, whatever passing they do? See, see, uh, Sam? Yeah. Um, well, look, Navy runs uh, basically the same offense that Army does, just different players. And so Service academies, by default, should be most familiar with defending the other service academy because they all run a triple option. And so they uh, probably have seen defending triple option more than any other type of offensive set. We you know when you take spring ball, you take, uh, you know, the, the summer camp and everything else that they do to get ready. Um, and then, of course, you know, for actual games, they have the scout team that's running the defense through reps against what they're expected to see. But 
when they actually run, uh, you know, first team O against first team D and first team O is running triple option, first team D is defending against triple option. Well, you know, it's first team O and first team D when you go in and you got the first team D playing Navy on, and, and now it's Navy running triple option instead of playing your own first team O in practice. So uh, stopping the run and being able to stop triple option football should be a forte of Army's defense. And uh, I know that when, uh, when Jay Bateman was the defensive coordinator, he did special uh, sessions um, throughout the season where you specifically got ready to play Navy and Air Force. And I, I can only imagine that Nate Woody does the same thing. That uh, you know, we're we're say you know maybe it's U UTSA week, and you're like, okay, we're getting ready for UTSA with the scout team, but let's break it. We're going to do a quick session of uh, you know beat Navy defense practice here, just to make sure we stay fresh on this, so we're fresh on it all season. And what Navy brings to the table is nothing new. Now, <clears throat> I alluded to this last week <clears throat> when I said the Army Navy game. This is the best time from the offensive playbook standpoint, and, I, and, and there's a defensive angle here, so, so bear with me. If you have plays that you've been practicing all season, but you have not unveiled yet, in other words, they're not on film, you have not uh, tipped your hand that it is in the playbook, this game is the time to run it. This game is the time to catch their defense flat-footed, unprepared for a certain play. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I'll give you an example. And this is where Army's defense really rose to the occasion. When we were in Mikey Stadium uh, a couple of seasons ago, um, Navy tried to run that uh, reverse play deep in their own territory, and Army scouted it. You know, Army defended it perfectly and ended up getting a safety. So uh, I don't know how often Navy had ever run that play during the course of that shortened season. I think that was the first time that they had broken it out. It just didn't work. But if you go back and look at that play, you see there was only one Army defender who was in position to stop that play, and he beat his block, who happened to be the B-back, and was in there to disrupt it. Otherwise, there was nobody on the perimeter that play might have gone for some big yardage. So I think Army's defense, they're going to be ready. They're going to be ready just to attack Navy. You know, the past couple of times uh, Army has played Navy, they, they've done a really good job of bottling up Navy's offense. And, uh, and, and I think that they're going to do the same thing this, this time around. I don't see any reason why they would not, um, other than the fact that, you know, they don't have Nolan Cockrell and Eric Smith in the middle. But I think they've kind of shored that up just a little bit. And then, you know, never, never forget the intensity factor and the motivation factor of playing your biggest rival, which this weekend represents. Okay. Well, let's go uh, into our lightning round and uh, go through our predictions on who's going to win the 123rd Army-Navy game in Philadelphia. Steve Shalhoub, would you like to lead off? Sure. You know, <clears throat> The key to victory is going to be who executes, obviously. Uh, it's going to be turnover, the fewest turnovers. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I, you know, how healthy can Army be in this game? And, and that's, going to be, that's going to be keys for Army. I think Army wins this game in a hard-fought battle. I think it's way under the 31 or 32-point over-under mark. I'm thinking it's 12 7 Army. I can't hear you, Ken. You're cutting out again, Ken. I'm not, I'm not hearing you, Ken. I'm taking How is energy. Army going to get 12 points? Is that um, going to be four field goals? Touchdown, touchdown, field goal safety. And a safety. Okay. Okay. Calling for a safety. Very good. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's give Jack McGurk a shot at it. Uh, Jack, what do you see uh, happening on Saturday? I do like Army in this game. You know, I was looking at the uh, history uh, with these two teams, what the, the uh, record is and stuff. 
and it's uh, pretty close actually. Uh, Army has 53 wins, Navy has 55, and there were seven ties. Um, so this one, uh, I like Army in this game. Uh, I think it's going to be a close one, but uh, I think I'm going to give it to Army. Uh, let's see. I'll say 24-14. Uh, 24-14. And uh, let's give Richard Miller a shot at it. Richard, what do you see uh, happening on Saturday? I see happening in this game. I think it's going. I think it's going to be a very a good game. I'm, I think Army's going to going to run the football really well. 24-17 Army by a touchdown. Okay, and Sam Houston, uh, what do you think is going to happen on Saturday? Well, you know, there's what I think is going to happen and what I want to happen. I'm going to try to put the two together. Um, but, um, um, man, I hope it doesn't turn out the way Steve predicted because, man, that, that sweat and bullets stuff every year, I, you know, we age pretty quickly at Army Navy when we're doing that bullet sweating in the fourth quarter, man. So uh, as much as I would love to see a blowout just once, where Army blows them out and in the fourth quarter, we're just up in club getting drunk and having a good old time. I don't know. I, I don't think this is the year where it's going to happen. Um, but I think that uh, Jack and, uh, and, and uh, I think you guys are, uh, uh, you're, you're on it. You're pretty close to what my prediction was going to be, um, you and Richard. But uh, I'm going to say that the, the score is going to be um, Army 27, Navy 17. And uh, so Army by 10. And it's going to be a one score game. And I, I just feel like uh, Navy's going to turn the ball over in their own territory. And that's going to lead to Army scoring a field, either a field goal or a touchdown late that's going to ice it and make the score a little bit bigger a difference than what the game actually was. Okay. Okay. I think you took the score I was going to take, Sam, 27 to 17. I think both teams are going to have some success running the ball, and uh, it's going to come down. To, it could very easily be tied, something like 14 all at the half. And then it's who can make the plays in the second half is really going to make the difference. Who can uh, get a turnover as, uh, or, you know, as Steve was saying, uh, if Army can get an interception, they got a couple of fumbles against Massachusetts. Uh, they did everything against Massachusetts they want to do. Uh, nearly, nearly perfect game uh, for Army. Uh, but uh, Navy's a much more experienced team. Uh, I think Keith, for Army, is just uh, – running the offense, running down the field, pounding the two fullbacks. Hopefully uh, uh, Tyson Riley will be healthy. Uh, uh, Jacoby Buchanan played well against Massachusetts. And uh, that's quite a, uh, a one-two punch when you have those two big fullbacks. And as we said, the key is getting the ball outside, either on passes to Isaiah Alston or pitch plays to um, Raheem Murphy or hopefully – Ajahn Marshall is able to play because he can make, he's a big play uh, uh, player. So I'm going to go for Army 32. Oh, I didn't quite know. hear you. 30 to 20, Army over he's Navy. Going. And I just, want to, I just want to mention we are, are um, developing a special uh, partnership Canvas Media. We've always admired the work of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Uh, they are, they've been providing scholarships to uh, children of, of fallen members of the Special Operations community, and they support uh, families in mentoring and, and uh, never forget a birthday. We've been very impressed. Uh, we've met some of their leadership at uh, at the at the Yankees uh, Military Appreciation Day over last few years, so we're going to hopefully talk to uh, a couple of their officials and representatives uh, between now and the game, and then going forward. So it's a, a great partner. We're privileged to uh, uh, highlight the great work that the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, based down in Tampa, 
is doing to support uh, military families. So any final thoughts before we break and uh, we get set to watch uh, one of the great sports events in, in America, the Army Navy game, any final thoughts? My last thought is that, um, you know, of our predictions, I'm just going to say that Steve's is probably the closest to what's actually going to happen. And uh, I'll give his evidence to that. Um, when Air Force Navy played, the final was 13 to 10. When Army and Air Force played, it was 13 to 7. So if you're coming to this game and you're looking for a big offensive, explosive offensive, you know, showdown, I, I don't think this is going to be the venue where you're going to see it. So I would love for it to be that way, but um, as long as we just uh, remember it's about beating Navy, so beat Navy. That's my final thought. Okay, well, thank you all. Steve, a final thought? Yeah, final thought is, you know, we lamented this season. There were some high points and some low points. But now we can make everything okay with a victory here, show ourselves, get the seniors out with a victory. <clears throat> everything else smooths itself over. But if we look back at this season, we look at Coastal, we look at Troy playing in a championship game. We look at UTSA, strong, playing the bowl game, dismantled the last opponent. UConn, going to a bowl. Wake Forest, dominant, top 20 team, top 15, got high that high. Um, we played some really good squads this year, not by name, right? They're not the Cincinnati's. They're not the – but – very successful programs. And if you look at a lot of the coaches we played against, they're all moving. Mm. Coastal Carolina is going to Liberty, right? We got people moving all over the place because they're moving up because of the great job they had for coaching. We fought hard. We never were really out of it. We just have higher expectations. So that's a good thing that we have higher expectations. These seniors are great, great kids and they're going to play their hearts out and we're going to come out victorious. But when you're thinking about it, it was a tough dang on season and we played some tough opponents. So we should be proud and we should be ready to go and let's kick some ass. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Certainly uh, we admire the seniors, uh, Markel brought the tremendous leadership on defense that he provided Andre Carter. Uh, what a talented player and uh, you know, offense Connor Bishop at center. And uh, really, I admire the toughness of Tyre Tyler and uh, oh, no, that he demonstrated no during the course of the year, coming back from injuries to play. And, and at the size he is, I don't think, I think he's soaking wet 170 pounds, um, what he's been able to do uh, on offense. Uh, and Jamel jo Jones as well, Cade Ballard and, and, and all the rest. So anyway, we will uh, reconvene. Hopefully it'll be a happy show next week. <clears throat> And we'll wrap it up for the season. But uh, thank you, uh, Sam Houston from the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama. Beat Navy. And uh, Jack McGurk from the uh, from Pelham. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Richard Miller from West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank and you. Steve Shalou from South Jersey. Richard, a final thought? A uh, final thought. You got to gotta finish the season strong. Beating Navy. Well, that, it won't release everything from what's been a struggling season but it will make the it will make everything you know good it will it will make um the up the it will have a good feeling going into um the, re the rest of the year beating absolutely navy, those seniors uh, will always navy, remember how they what did in the army navy game their seniors yes. okay let's break and thank everybody thank you for watching we'll see you in philadelphia on saturday three o'clock start of the Army-Navy game. Looking forward to it so much. Thank you for watching.